mysteries abound around the world. From strange lights in the night sky to ghostly apparitions passing from one realm to the next. From the great pyramids of Egypt to what lies beneath the depths of Loch Ness. From Bigfoot to Atlantis, they are all mysteries waiting to be solved. Join Laurie Phillips, Lauren Smith, Graz, and Billy Simmons as they search for the truth on Night Colors Radio. Welcome to Night Colors Bigfoot Radio. It's March 19th, 2015, and you're here with your hosts, Lauren Smith, Lori Phillips, Billy Simmons, and Graz Hopper. How are you guys doing tonight? Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> doing good. Um, Wonderful. Doing, yeah. <laughs> doing really good. Thanks, Lauren. Billy, how are you? Doing pretty good. No complaints. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no oh, well, complaining yeah. a whole lot before the show. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I'm still alive. That's all that counts. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh. Well, I, well, I'm back. Uh, last week, you know, I was uh, mourning the loss of a good friend, Shannon Brown. She was a co-worker, and we lost her in a car wreck at the age of 31. So last weekend, we planted a golden apple tree out in the yard, and we call it Shannon. Aww. And uh, anyway, now Shannon has leaves, and pretty soon Shannon will have blooms. And so anyway, we miss her. Really bad. It's been real hard, but and I thank everyone for letting me kind of lay out last weekend. I just really wasn't in the mood to be on the air, and uh, so thanks for to all our listeners, and they probably were glad they didn't have to listen to me. <laughs> no, you better stop it, or else I'm going to mute your mic for the rest of the night. <laughs> that would do me fine. No, I just I like to no. talk to our guests. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are glad to have you back. You know, we we really held it together pretty well without the boss. Uh, we we're all, you know, we were really good. I mean, I think we need cookies or something for how good we were. You, you do. You both, all of you, get a brownie button and a cookie because y'all were excellent last week. I was so proud of you and listening to the show. It was fun of us just to sit back and listen. And I know I shouldn't even been listening, but I couldn't help myself. <laughs> I had to listen in, and then I called in because Blog Talk quit on me, and I couldn't hear mm-hmm. anymore. So I had to call in. And then y'all put me on the air. <laughs> we couldn't let you get away with just sitting back and relaxing. How dare you I take know. a vacation from Night Colors? How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I tell you what, I really enjoyed listening to you guys. Did a fantastic job. Really could see the chemistry there between all of us. And um, it, it, it just gave the guys a chance to really come forward a little more out of their shell, out of their quiet little corners they try to stay in and so I was glad that they came out. I felt so <laughs> out, of, out of the closet, not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, don't put it that oh, way. Right? <laughs> You're just trying to get Billy all up in arms tonight, aren't you? Uh, help me, Billy. I, I feel so vulnerable. <laughs> um, well, they didn't refer to me as Squatch Goddess, but I suppose they did a good job. Yeah. Well, we do have your T-shirts on order, by the way. So, Just <laughs> well, 
We are all really excited to have Mr. Tom Yamarone from California on the show tonight. Um, everybody out there, please feel free to join in the chat discussion and ask any questions that you might have for Tom or the host. Also, just to let everyone know, if you're unable to listen to the whole show and you have to leave, we are now partnered with Stitcher.com, so you can download their app and listen to Nightcallers on the go. Um, there's no more streaming, no more buffering, you know, downloads, anything besides the app. Um, you can just turn it on and listen. Uh, you can even click listen later so that you can have it in queue. Um, I'll put that link into our chat room so you can find it on our show page. Um, so get your drinks and snacks, everyone, and get settled in. It's going to be a great night. Brad, tell us about our awesome guest. Well, Wait, just, before Brad uh, does, just, oh, it's just, oh, before Brad right does, I just want to mention, anybody that wants to call in and talk to Tom, the number is 347-989-0313. And uh, we welcome all calls. Be sure uh, to uh, select one. That will put you in the host queue. That way we know you're not just listening in and you have a question. Okay, take it away, guys. Now, just to clarify, I know Lauren is from Oklahoma, and she's got a bit of an accent. When you say Stitchers, it's S-T-I-T-H. <laughs> Stitchers.com. Uh-oh. Just thought I'd clarify. Nothing Ooh. But I've, I've been hearing hasn't Stitchers. had his... Legalized brownies tonight, huh? Correcting me. You're brave. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry. It's well, you know, I'm not sure. Darren, we don't talk new people talking funny <laughs> down there. You know? www.stitchcher.com. Y'all hear that out there? <laughs> <laughs> Go eat some brownies, guys. Read the bio. Get on it. Maybe, yes, maybe you can sign it. Yes, it over and out. Yes, <laughs> Tom, Tom, Tom. All right. Next up, in the North American Sasquatch Researcher Series, we have California researcher, songwriter Tom Yamarone. Tom is a Bigfoot researcher and songwriter from Livermore, California who has been actively investigating the Bigfoot Sasquatch phenomenon for over 15 years. His search for proof of Sasquatch involves acquiring audio and photographic evidence, as well as first-hand accounts. Tom hopes to educate amateur researchers in the proper documentation of possible Bigfoot evidence. He has organized several major conferences in California and Washington. The history of Bigfoot research is a passion of his. This has inspired him to compose and perform songs about Bigfoot in tribute to these historic figures and accounts in the Sasquatch lore. Tom is the chairman of the board of directors for the Alliance of Independent Bigfoot Researchers, which is at BigfootResearch.com. In 2014, Tom made his big screen debut in Bobcat Goldthwaite's Bigfoot film, Willow Creek, performing his song, Roger and Bob, wrote out that day. He is convinced these creatures exist based on the available evidence and the thousands of eyewitness accounts. Tom has one request of you. Please include a scale item in your photographs of possible Bigfoot evidence. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Graz. How about you, Tom? Are you are you with us? That's excellent, Graz, uh, and thank you so much. I, it's great to be on with all of you tonight. Thanks for having me. Well, it's a it's a pleasure to have you and an honor to have you, Tom. Uh, you know, you were highly requested by our listeners, well, and uh, really? so I wanted you to know that. Yes, well, I've sent yes. a lot of five dollar bills around the world, so you know <laughs> that seems to be paying off. Uh, no, and I, I, I after listening to that long winded uh, bio, I, I, I had a note here that I should uh, tweet my bio next time. So, uh, yeah. oh. Keep it under 130 about- characters, but uh, no, hey, that's great. That's so great. I've been requested. Well, I'm so glad to be on, and I don't do a lot of these uh, show interviews, but you came highly request, uh, highly uh, referred, you know. Really? So, uh, yeah, my good friend Dave McCullough says I gotta you oh, know, get yes. up and do the show. Yes, Dave was wonderful. 
Dave was a wonderful guest. He's the one. He's from Pennsylvania. He was our Pennsylvania researcher. Is that right? No, he's Massachusetts, and and that was a wonderful show. Yeah, it, it was a great show. He had some recordings. Yes, and he. I remember he had the accent, and I absolutely loved listening to. I remember. I remember Dave now. Oh my goodness, we talked to so many people that sometimes it's. But he 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 stood out because he had that marvelous accent that I could listen to all day long, that Boston accent, you know, that wicked Boston ass accent. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, Dave came out to California in 2007, and he was a real surprise. We had at the last minute with my late friend uh, and a great researcher, Joyce Carney from San Francisco, we had organized a small. Uh, a conference, really, uh, at, in Willow Creek for the 40th anniversary of the Patterson-Gimlin film, and there were several people who had bought uh, non-refundable plane tickets that were coming to a more expensive, elaborate event that was canceled a few weeks before the anniversary, and Dave was one of those, and so just out of the blue, he got to meet our what we call the California crew, and, you know, the uh-huh. uh, Bobo and... Uh, uh, the late Scott McLean and uh, Bart Catino and Cliff Berrickman, we all were, you know, in- integral in putting together this uh, small uh, celebration. But Dave was there, and that's how I how we met Dave and became great friends. Wow. I, I know he, he told me all about it. <laughs> we had several phone conversations before the actual show and told me how exciting it was. And I told him I was really jealous for him to get to meet all those people like that right off the bat. He was very right. blessed. Right, he and then he was in, in touch with us. So when we did this Yakima Bigfoot Roundup two years later, uh, Dave, again, you know, traveled out west. And so uh, it, it's been great. And then in my travels the last few years with Bob Gimlin uh, on – on four, three trips, and we'll make a fourth trip this May. And we were at the Ohio Bigfoot Conference, and Dave, you know, drove. I believe it's like ten or twelve hours, you know, from Boston to be there. So. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you've been, you have been a researcher for fifteen years. Yeah. That that that's as long as I've been doing it. So that would be two thousand. The year 2000 that you actually sort of began. So, can you tell me why you picked this up? What mm-hmm. what happened to make you interested in this subject? Okay, yeah, yeah. I don't have that typical. Um, a lot of uh, people our age have that typical. I saw the legend of Boggy Creek, or or okay. the In Search of, or the movie in the 1970s. For me, it happened okay. late. And it was actually when they <clears throat> re-ran the In Search of on the History Channel in the 90s. And then the History Channel ran a documentary that had three segments, and one of them was about Bigfoot. And it was actually an excellent little 18-minute segment. And then just after that, that, that really spurred my interest to begin looking for books. And in libraries where I lived in Oh, the Santa Clara County area, uh, Palo Alto, San Jose, the libraries would only have one book. So I'd go to one library and get the book. I don't believe it was a John Green book and then a Rene de Hinden's book. And slowly, Grover Krantz, as I you know, was reading the books, and then we made a trip in the summer of 2000 to go to Humboldt County, my family uh, and my brother's family. And, after the, and at that time, I was well into my uh, uh, interest. I was drawing pictures of Bigfoot in the Redwoods with my daughter and, you know, the, with the kids. And, and so uh-huh. as we, we left Humboldt County, we drove across the state and you go through Willow Creek and we stopped to take a picture at the Bigfoot statue, the Jim McLaren Oma statue. And uh, we said goodbye to my brother and his family and we went in the museum and it was there uh, that Initially, we were just up front. They have an elaborate gift shop for, for, for Bigfoot, really. They have all a, a number of books and shirts and 
coffee cups and whatnot, but they had a journal that people could write in with their accounts. And it was fascinating just to read this, you know, like reading accounts on the And there was one, you know, we had just been at the Avenue of the Giants in the Redwoods, and there was an account from the week before, you know, late at night, saw one cross the road. And so finally the woman behind the counter said, well, do you want to see the collection? And we thought, well, this this isn't it. And you had to, at that time, leave the the small Pioneer Gold Rush era museum and go outside and go into another building. And, and as soon as I walked in, uh, the t- first two display cases were the Jerry Crew footprint cast and the Patterson Gimlin film with the with the two footprint casts, and those had a huge impact on me. And from just being interested in it, having seen it on TV and read the books, to actually see the plaster footprint casts in person really lit a fire under me. And I I immediately my in my mind said, you know, there's something to this that the Something left those prints, you know, and and that those things live in our forest. So I was really determined to try to meet people to go out camping with, to look for evidence, look for Bigfoot. And then that occurred, you know, three years later when I attended the uh, International Bigfoot Symposium in Willow Creek. And that's where you, you began to meet people to actually go out with? Yes, yeah. Okay. And, then I was just lucky. Uh, the first few folks I went out with were, you know, hit and miss, and and we were camping near Oroville, California, in the Sierras. And uh, but actually, the first trip two weeks later, this group of guys back then were calling themselves the Bigfoot Ranger Team, and uh, they were uh, just a four or five guys that were ex-military, but you know, not a real militaristic group. They just used that name, and one of them uh, had met a friend of Kathy Strains, Kathy Moskowitz at that time, and and they uh, the, so this guy and, and 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 Kathy's friend, you know, wanted to camp or you know were, wanted to join up, and they arranged a camping trip to South Lake Tahoe, and I was invited by this fella I had met there, and. And so on that camping trip in early October 2003, I met Bob and Kathy, who, you know, basically have been my mentors and, and uh, did did a, an immense amount from to get me involved in active field research. So that was my lucky turn. And that night, you know, we actually had some strange primate-like high-pitched screams uh, calling back to the... Uh, call blast and we were doing and I recorded them on a on a camcorder. How did you feel when you got something like that? Where it was it surely it was very exciting. It was. You know, and it, it was exciting um and it was thrilling. I wasn't uh there was no fear factor because we were in a nice uh competent group of uh folks. Everyone was uh really level headed and uh approaching it, you know, as as and not overreacting and uh a lot of them were very skeptical so they weren't even reacting at all to what we were hearing. But throughout the night when we were back in base camp, this same kind of high pitched scream was occurring, you know, uh I'd say a few hundred yards away, up up the creek and up the hillside the it's very unusual area there because you are in this Lake Tahoe Basin, but everything south of you is uh, is wilderness, you know, uh, into the high country of the Sierras. So, um, no, that was very exciting. And uh, from there, uh, I kept in touch with Bob, and we camped a few more times throughout the winter. And then in April of 2004, Kathy and Bob and uh, Mantra, uh, organized uh, an outing called Operation Odyssey, and that was where we could attend. It was really publicized only, as far as I know, on the Bigfoot forums, but if you could make it to this campground outside of Oroville up in the mountains in April that year, uh, you we had workshops on uh, documenting footprint evidence, photographs, uh, making maps, uh, based on Kathy's article that she co-wrote that was at the BFRO site, the 
the article about archaeological data methods. And so uh, we we had a great outing there. My my wife attended with me, and then that really helped too because she got to know the people involved. And and a young Cliff Berrickman, a teacher from Long Beach, attended that outing. And um, uh, yeah, we all got to know each other on a. It, it actually snowed that weekend, you know, on our last night. So real bonding experience. So that's about really the the keys to my getting into it. Okay. So, have you ever had a sighting, Tom? No. I'm going to jump right into it. No. No, have unfortunately, you, uh, I, I have not had a, a sighting. I think I say to people, and I haven't had a sighting, but I've been in situations where I, I, I believe what I've heard was something close by, whether it be a wood knock that I've recorded, uh-huh. singular wood knocks, or a branch being snapped uh, on a camping trip in September 2004 that was really loud at 3 a.m. near our, and the only kind of activity like that that night. And yeah. uh, but uh, you know what? What helped though? At, at, at the and at the same time, uh, a few a month later, this was prior just prior to expeditions, right? I didn't go on BFRO expeditions, the first one, but I was invited, thanks to Kathy and Bob, to be an investigator. And so soon after, in May and June, I began to interview eyewitnesses. And uh, I got to say, um, the, and then later that summer, you know, went on my first expedition up in Washington. But the interviewing eyewitnesses has really been a convincing aspect for me. I imagine. I yeah. imagine. So, can you uh, tell us which which uh, eyewitness um, encounter that you were told about that most impressed you? Can you tell us a little bit about that one? Is there one that actually stuck with you throughout these years? You know, from the early years, there was just a few uh, from cars. There was a, a, a family, a San Bernardino County uh sheriff was driving back from Humboldt County with his family, and they had observed one along the Eel River walking uh, along an embankment, you know, the, of the river out in open sandbar. Um, and others, I'm just, boy, I really need to go review my files. Uh, from those early years, it's funny, they you you start to replace the ones, you, the most recent ones, and there's this fellow uh-huh. I've interviewed on my a blog t- on my YouTube uh, channel called Bugs. Bugs Adamson has had a series of encounters. But I've got to point to Bob Strain. Uh, uh, he told us about his sighting while deer hunting in uh, Idaho. I believe it was in the 1970s. And he was hunting with his father and uncle and cousins, you know, family outing, uh, way up there in the interior of Idaho, I think near Chalice, Idaho. And uh, there was a time he was waiting while his dad and uncle Sorry. went around. Oh, that's okay. And they uh, they were supposed to more or less go to this opposite ridge and push towards, you know, where he had a, a, a shot into an open part of the uh, mountainside. And as he was waiting, this large... <laughs> or not large, this disfigured, this upright figure that he didn't know was large at the time emerged into that clearing, but it wasn't wearing orange. Or, you know, so he thought, oh. what the heck's with this? And he looked at it through the scope and realized, well, that's strange. You know, this per- this person's not wearing orange and walking upright. And and I, I, I think as he tells it, he didn't think much of it at that time, but about 20 minutes later, his dad and uncle emerge into that clearing, and he puts his fingers up for emphasis. This thing was about a, a third taller than his dad and uncle. So at wow. that point, he realized what he had seen was immense, you know, and uh, that that's yeah. an excellent dramatic uh, account. What would you say is the differences between California Big, Bigfoot and Bigfoot reported in other parts of the country? Is there a similarity, or are there some stark differences? 
You know, I think so. I've always heard that. Like, I know what you're referring to. I, I, I met mm-hmm. some folks from Texas at Willow Creek in 2003, and, and they talked about, oh, the, the ones down there being more aggressive, uh, uh, different temperament, let's say. And I'm, I'm of the opinion now, after, all, after these years looking into this, that I believe it's, uh, they're very similar. Um, there may be adaptations for their uh, uh, habitat, uh, things like that, maybe uh, size differences um, from some of the different areas. But I think temperament, when you, when you get into that, it's more just how and where you encounter them. Um, right. I certainly have heard about angry Sasquatch uh, Bigfoots in uh, California uh, and and up into Washington and the uh, Oregon area. Uh, so again, I I would be of the opinion now, just if, if I had to guess or speculate, that I'd I'd think it's more situational. Are you are they are you impinging on their uh, territory or food? Are you interrupting something? Um, you know, and that guy Bugs, who I mentioned that I have four of interviews with him on the YouTube channel, which is Bigfoot Songs Zero Four. Um, Two of his encounters were very calm and peaceful with a huge 10-foot uh, male, Bigfoot. And two of them were real intense intimidation displays. So, I don't know. I I'd, I'd guess there you know, it would just be, for me, uh, an this individual. This not the same bug that was on Art Bell that... No. They shot two and buried them. Different guys, no. right? Yeah, different okay. guys, same same nickname. Yeah. It okay. Must, must have been a, a popular nickname for folks that are. I get Bugs is probably in in his early seventies now. So. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, he's somebody that came to one of our. We have a small uh, Bay Area uh, meeting uh, with uh, my friend Jerry Hine, who's a researcher from the Bay Area here, and the late Joyce Carney. We started to meet you know, once a month on Sundays, and uh, this fella, saw, Jerry also drives a great truck back then, and now he has a van, and it has a Sasquatch research team uh, decals all over it, and and this fella saw his truck and followed him home one day, and he actually lives just over the hills on, at the coast in a town called Half Moon Bay, but yeah, Bugs is, uh, was just a, a great, another really convincing uh, eyewitness and has excellent outdoor skills, um, and and it, and again uh, is is an excellent observer. So uh, yeah. Okay. Oh. Try that again. Am I a little clearer oh, now? Go. It's clear now. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I apologize. It's way up holding my phone. Um, what the question was: What is the tallest specimen reported in California? Well, from what I know, I'd have to say this one. I don't know of one taller than ten feet. Um, uh, from what I've read, I remember there was one reported up in. Was in Alberta at a at a dam construction site. Uh, it was in John Green's book uh, uh, in the early seventies, twelve feet. Um, so I'd, I'd say you know ten. And again, that's really an impressive uh, biped. You know, and, mm-hmm. and, yeah, definitely and eight. And, and and I guess what stands out now with the, uh, the different eyewitness accounts. And, and again, we I do. Uh, very much uh, endorse and uh, enjoy the participation of, of Jeff Meldrum, Dr. Meldrum, and Dr. Bender Noggle in, in this research and, and their analysis of the foot structure, the width, the, the, the wider heel, the flexing in the middle. You know, that's all something I completely uh, agree with uh, you know, or, or uh, uh, endorse and and but with the another thing I, I notice with eyewitnesses is they're not all heavily uh muscled like the Patterson Gimlin film subject but uh-huh. 
they always seem to have really wide shoulders and uh and of course that aspect of seeming to have no neck you know the head squat on the shoulders uh there but that that wide shoulders is something that John Bendernagel points out in his first book would, would be something we'd include in a North American mammal guide because again a a, a black bear standing up would have sloped shoulders and of right. course a snout and round ears on its head and and he, he depicts it with an artist drawing showing you know if you just included the side view and front view you know that's a very impressive uh, it seems to be what impresses most eyewitnesses is that mass of the the wide shoulders yeah what do you think of Ron Moorhead and the Sierra Sound? Do you think that there is possibility that Bigfoot have a language? Well, first, I think those are genuine sounds, and those were Absolutely. You know, a, a unique situation they were in. And I was fortunate enough in two years, and I, with the music, too, um, you know, I had the song, the one song at Willow Creek, and I got to play it during a break on Sunday, and seemed a lot of people went to get water right then, but uh, uh, it was really hot. <laughs> but two years later, I was invited by Jason and his late wife, Star Valenti, and Paul Smith, the great artist Paul Smith, to go up to Bellingham for their Sasquatch Research Conference. And I played a few songs each day, And uh, uh, but there, um, you know, the... Uh, uh, that's where, uh, basically, uh, in, in, in 2005, we, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I, I just lost my train of thought. What was the question? Oh, that's fine. <laughs> the, the question, well, shoot, I can't even remember the question. We do have a new question from the chat. Oh, no, it, it was got a really me off good the question. old question. It was, the, it was about the Sierra oh, Sounds. What do you, oh, the Sierra Sounds. Yeah, yes, stay with that. Yes, That's really Sierra good. So I got to meet Ron and and uh, and Al Barry. They were speaking oh, at, wow. at at at, at um, Bellingham. So that was excellent. And they gave a great presentation. And and at the, of course the whole story, which is now out in Ron's book, um, the what is it called? The Cries in the Voices in the Wilderness. And uh, yes. Um, I, I edited that book for him, which was excellent. But but Al Berry always tells his story. So this Ron and and the family uh, of the hunters, the deer hunters, I think was two families involved in Ron, and they had had that established camp. And this wasn't an ongoing thing. It more or less started up the year before. I guess it was 71, 72, so somewhere around 70 something started to happen and and so they reported it to um uh Peter Byrne who had this uh roadside display in the Dalles at in the Dalles, Oregon. Um and he was unable to come down and investigate, so he asked Al Berry who was in Redding, California, probably 200 miles north of where Ron was in Mariposa, and he came down, and you know, the story goes, he went up there with them that summer and brought recording equipment, and he was very skeptical, of course. He was trying to see how these guys were doing this, you know, and he was, you know, snooping around while they were out hunting, and that's what impressed me most. He was never able, of course, it wasn't a hoax or somebody with speakers, and, uh-huh. and then, you know, that's really impressive, and it's it's very unique and it's only at that time have we started to hear people say i've heard that oh gibberish they call the samurai chatter it's been called and mm-hmm. and uh, uh-huh. bobo bobo had heard it in the redwoods and and he mentioned that to ron and al and they both oh big bug eyes did you record it and no i didn't record it and and then a guy back east in ohio i think he was from virginia on expedition in ohio actually recorded a very similar sound, and Ron has it on his site. I think his site is BigfootSounds.com. And uh, so the long of it here, big long-winded yammering answer is, um, you know, then in 2009, uh, Scott Nelson came to the first Yakima Bigfoot Roundup, and we got to hear that outstanding uh, analysis that he's done, you know, where he uh, phonetically transcribe the sounds. So, yeah, I, I would have to say yes, they, they have language. 
Wow. I, don't, I don't know what it, kind of language it is, but but it uh, seems to me, from what uh, eyewitnesses have also observed as well, back and forth calling, you know, would seem to be uh-huh. indicative of that as well. Yeah. That's absolutely true. Um, we have a question from the chat. Let me see if I can find it again. Bill, you wouldn't happen to have it handy, would you? I can find it big through all of y'all, whatever yeah. it all is. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we have a question. From, we have a question. I am not even guys. looking at what you guys are writing because I couldn't concentrate on Tom if I did. So there, go ahead. Yeah. All right, we have a question from Purple Rose, and she wants to know if Tom has had any new sightings he has researched or taken in recently. Okay. Yeah, I I I have one. Uh, you know, I haven't been online uh, i did uh, we did an event in the fall the yakima bigfoot roundup and that was a another tribute event to the pioneers of bigfoot research uh and a lot of uh, time involved and then it seemed i more or less took the winter off but i haven't looked into the database lately in california but during that time of preparing for that event i did get a call and this was from a woman who had an encounter in 1982 in California and it was just fascinating it was harrowing very traumatic experience for her uh, as a teenager and it was great and you know in in the middle of all this probably three weeks of you know 40 hours or more and you know four hours a night on the phone or emails uh, all this correspondence that I get someone referred to me by a man who had a sighting two years ago while he was deer hunting in the Sierras. And this connection was because that Willow Creek Museum has that um, journal book in in the front gift shop area. Well, after camping one year with Bobo and Cliff and Bob Strain and I had driven up together, we stopped in Willow Creek just to check, you know, always go in the museum if it's open. And um, there was a note in there from a guy saying he had just found footprints in a little town called Hyam Palm, uh, which is a little south of Willow Creek. It's really hard to get to. So what I did is I took a digital picture of his note, and he had his phone number there, and his name was Jensen. So, uh, you know, I gave him a call a week or so later. And so, I, you know, I had this phone con- uh, connection with Jensen, and through him, uh, he was a retired, he's now retired, he was a high school uh, art teacher and wrestling coach. And some of his <laughs> students, you know, he'd bring cast to class and he influenced his students. And this man was deer hunting and had a pretty fascinating, quick encounter, but a really good observer again of what he saw, an eight foot tall, uh, lithe one, a thin one, but again with the broad mm-hmm. shoulders. So this man, the long of it, referred this woman, Sandy, to give me a call. And it was a fascinating two hours. And to sum her sighting up, she was, uh, 1983, was 15, and uh, on a Friday night in uh, Lake County, which is south of Clear Lake, California, not typically Bigfoot country, but connected up into Mendocino and Humboldt with the wildlife corridor. Uh, You know, she was on her uh, property outside of town, and the kids said, uh, let's go take a, a moonlight ride on, you know, let's go ride some your horse. And so they drove her down in a Jeep uh, about a quarter mile to this pasture, and uh, she got out and whistled for her horse, and it didn't come. And that really started to re- spook her. You know, her horse always came to her. And uh, at, right at that moment, the kids all slammed the doors and said, ha, 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 and peeled out and left her there in the dark. And and at that moment, something approached her, and she got very, you know, unnerved and fearful and began to just walk quickly back up to her home. And it paralleled her on the dirt road in the dark. And she said she could feel the ground shaking, you know, the, the vibration through the ground, and described it to me saying, I know what I was feeling. I've had horses run right by me, you know, that this ground shaking and so again it was very traumatic she cried most of this phone call retelling this and this you know occurred 30 years ago 32 years ago 
And so that that's the latest account I heard. She did make it back to her house. It was always within, I'd say, you know, 15, 20 feet of her. She could hear it breathing uh, and feel uh-huh. her mouth shaking in the dark. And then it somehow, you know, made it ahead of her as she got to the area where the cars were parked in the house. And it stood facing her backlit by the light on the eve on the roof of the barn and uh and then as she got she then wondered where's her dog you know why isn't my dog out here helping me and this right. thing, it came towards her you know and uh and she dove between the truck and the porch and and again she has a vivid recollection of the hand reaching down towards her and she again like bugs in one of his encounters he saw a hand whip in a willow tree and describe these black sausage-like fingers with chiseled nails and that's with no prompting exactly how she described the hand that reached down towards her and she could then she turned her head to kind of like you'd pull your head under your covers you know uh mm-hmm. and and she could said she felt pup, the puppy breath on my neck you know so it was oh, like oh. leaning over inspecting her but it never harmed her, and and it, the dog eventually broke free from its whimpering under the porch, and that distracted the the Bigfoot enough to, to where it it exited the yard. But yeah, that was told to me in October, and uh, that occurred. I'm not sure of the month. I think it was a summer month in uh, 1982. Wow, that's that is a great story. A great story. Uh, and Lauren, are you still on um, on your phone? Huh? I'm on my phone. My computer just restarted all of a sudden by itself. So, um, yeah. I um, want us to give you a few minutes before we go to footers. Yes, please. I'll let you know when I'm ready. <laughs> okay. How about that question from the chat? And we do have a phone call, but we've got to get that one after footers. How about that question from the chat? All right. Hey, Tom, can you tell us about your closest encounter? My closest encounter was probably sleeping across the tent from Bobo. No. Uh, <laughs> 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 now, you just put that on the time, the, time we, the time we had four of us in my in my tent in uh, Washington. Uh, no, no, it, you know, uh, I'm, I'm really... Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, it was so cold that night. We had to spoon there, bros. And uh, oh, no. okay, we won't name names. <laughs> yeah, um, no, the it, uh, wasn't the, rain, you know, right? Not the, it, it was on a trip with Bobo, actually. Most, uh, and that was that night. We were, I'll say where we were. We were, you know, people don't like to say locations. We were at Fish Lake, and it was the first trip I had ever taken with him. And we met up with a guy I had camped with that summer, named Dave, Dave Osborne, and his son Jake. And our friend Robert Leiterman brought his two boys, Forrest and Francis. So really neat camp situation. You know, we were, uh, this is a forested camp ground. Uh, At that time it had no host. We were excited to be the only ones seemingly there on a Friday, you know, had set up at the edge where basically the lakes on one side down below an embankment and the the hills, uh, the forest starts right there and Bluff Creek's, a ways away down in a deep gully your bluff creek uh, to be around that area there's just miles and miles of driving it would take us a half hour to even get back the nine miles to the highway uh so we're in this little bowl uh, of a saddle uh topographically at fish lake and um i brought organic apples i always brought a food offering that was something in talking to eyewitnesses that I like to do. I like to bring a food offering. I don't like to point a camera at it. And we left these apples um, out on a stump, and it was just uh, in this. And the and these these campsites are separated by almost alleyways through the brush, you know. So this old stump was there between our camp and another, but not far in from the forest. And, and 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 oddly enough, uh, you know, around nine o'clock, uh, two late arrivals come in, two carloads, and there's uh, two families, and they set up camp, and we got the full-on 
kids, you know, they weren't yelling. They, they were trying to get him to bed. But we had the baby crying in, in the tent next to ours. And, and uh, we drove out that night and did some calling. And we wouldn't call from camp. We drove back out the road five or six miles. And as we came back in, we'd stop and call and listen for 20 minutes and, and nothing. We might have thought we heard whoops, but at the time I wasn't recording audio. I was still using my camcorder for that. But So I eventually went to bed around two. Uh, yeah, two. Or no, one. I mean, I, was, I had gotten up at five to drive up from here to pick up Bobo to then drive into country. So I was exhausted and and I was asleep in the tent, and he comes ripping the door open, and he and Robert were the only ones awake, and something had, bam, 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 ran in and scooped up half our apples, and bam, 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 ran ran out. And uh, they didn't want to shine a light at it. You know, we were hoping for a weekend of... But that was about the closest, and and he and they woke me up and said something just took the apples. And, you know, we we did go over after about 20 minutes and inspect, and... Eleven apples were gone, and and so again we retired and it, it, it got back in the tent and and at three a.m. this huge branch was snapped. It sounded like it was just right above the tent. It was actually probably like thirty yards out in the forest. But yeah, that's probably the most exciting close encounter thing I've had happen. It's good that you used uh, organic apples. And a lot of people take <laughs> apples out there, and yeah. they get refused. They don't want to take regular store-bought apples. And people don't know this, but they're dyed yeah. and they're waxed. Yeah, they're waxed, um, right? And they're sprayed. And I mean, I, I went, to co- went to a college with this guy named Martinelli, or his mom's name was Martinelli, you know, from the Jews. And uh, uh, he said whenever they sprayed their orchards down there in Aptos or or down there near, uh, you know, Salinas, they had to bring the dogs in, you know. So, yeah, always wash or peel your apples. But, you know, I would never have done that, Chris. I But what happened was uh, I missed the store, you know, in somewhere, either in Fortuna or uh, I typically would stop in Eureka. So my last option was this organic store, really cool store in an old Victorian building on the right as just about your – about well, Highway 101 leaves Eureka and heads towards Arcata. So I stopped in, and, you know, usually it's a – I'm already with the typical camp food, but it, it was for us some fruit and uh, onions and zucchini and then uh, a bag of ice. And uh, But I, that's why I got the apples because that was my only option. And, yeah, good call. But uh, anyway, it was an exciting trip, and uh, – yeah, it was always great though. I'll to talk later about the, how much it, 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 I love, the, and that's why I love the history of going back to Bluff Creek and 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 how that all resulted in ultimately, you know, from Willow Creek uh, meeting Bob uh, Gimlin and then running into Bobcat Goldthwait in 2012. You know, after five days camping at Bluff Creek with uh, Bill Munns and the uh, the Bluff Creek film site guys and our friends. and uh, uh, That's a weird one. We'll have to go into Bob Goldthwaite in the second half. Uh, that, yeah, that, that was, that, was just that, a, a cool. random encounter, you know, to, to run yeah. into him. But we'll we'll tell that after the break. Is Lauren back? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah he's ready to roll. So let's go to footers. This is Walter Cronkite, and this is the way it is. Now, with Lauren Smith and Footers in the Field. Hey everyone, it's time for your weekly dose of Footers in the Field. This one was sent to me by one of our awesome listeners in the chat, and um, this one is just a, a story that this individual read, but it's still pretty interesting, so I'm going to go ahead and relay it on to you. Starts out, the only thing I can think of happened years ago, and this was back when it was okay to build permanent tree stands nailed into trees. I had scouted a new area and settled in on an area where an oak flat joined with a big, thick swamp. It was pretty open except for one grove of head-high palmettos and brush that came from behind my stand and went into the swamp. I was able to climb into a fork of an oak tree by climbing a small dogwood next to it. After hoisting up my wood, 
and nailing up a very stable platform and feed about 15 to 20 feet up, I dumped out some corn and left. This was in the summer as I was hog hunting, and it was two weeks before I made it back to hunt. Everything was fine as I walked in before daylight and got settled in. I noticed the corn was gone and lots of fresh hog sign that I could see by my small light. After everything quieted back down, as I sat in the dark, I kept having that feeling of being watched. Now, I've hunt, hunted, camped, and grew up in the woods, and I'm at, completely at home day or night in the deepest, darkest swamps and never felt this feeling. I wasn't scared because I didn't know to be. I just couldn't put my finger on it. The feeling never changed, but I couldn't get used to it. I was just on edge, I guess. I never saw or heard any animals that morning that I can remember until I was climbing down about mid-morning. I had lowered my rifle and was in the process of slithering from the oak to the little dogwood when I saw something out of the corner of my eye about the same time I heard it. I heard the crash and just barely caught sight of something running through the palmettos parallel to me. Now, I say barely because it looked like a huge, man-high brown dog. Honestly, I instantly thought buffalo. How crazy is that? It crashed through the thicket and I heard it hit the water. It sounded like a herd of hogs plowing through. I wrote it off of the deer that jumped, and I had, and me glimpsing it made it look different. Well, I thought about that sight and that feeling I'd had all morning as I drove back home to do a little bit of work before hunting again that evening. Around two or so that afternoon, I was again walking back into that stand, still thinking about the oddness of the morning. It was only about a quarter mile or so in, and I was walking, and I was there and settled in quick enough. Again, everything was oddly quiet. I had been sitting maybe an hour or so when I heard the faint splash of what I assumed was hogs across the thicket in the swamp. As it got louder, instead of that excited, eager feeling you would normally get, I was getting nervous. It was so weird because I'd never felt that way before. Well, what I thought were a bunch of hogs turned out to be one single critter. When it, when it was within 100 yards, I could hear it so plain and clear. Whatever it was was in no hurry and stayed out of sight on my blind side across the thicket. I'd scouted out all of this, and I knew the water, that it was waist deep on me, and this thing was picking its feet or legs clear out of the water as it walked. I could hear the splash, drip, 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 splash, as it put one foot in front of the other real slow-like. It was trying to be quiet. I thought it might be another person until I thought about how deep that water was. I would never point a gun or at a noise or anything I wasn't planning to kill dead, but as that noise got louder and got to the edge of the thicket, I was looking down the barrel. Still on a, still on safe and finger off the trigger, but still, you got to know me to know how serious this must have been. I was actually shaking. Well, it got to the edge of the water within about 40 yards of the thicket before it was open ground between us. It crashed about 10 or 15 yards and then went quiet, deathly quiet. No sound, no frogs, no crickets, no birds, no nothing. I might have imagined it, but I thought I could hear something every now and then like it was slipping in on me. It was getting dark by then, and I had to say I was shaking. And if I had to say I was shaking, it would be an understatement. I never saw or heard anything else that evening, but I walked out backwards right before dark. I was so put off by it, I had forgotten my bag, fanny pack today, hanging on a nail in the stand. I realized that while I was driving home. I told my granddaddy about it that night, and he, of course, made fun of me. If all that wasn't bad enough, here's the most crazy part that folks don't believe. It was two days later before I got the nerve to go back in after my bag. I carried a shotgun this time as I felt more secure with it than even though I doubt I could have hit anything at this point. It was an old rabbit ear, and I kept my thumb on the hammer the whole walk in. And, of course, I went in midday, and I kept my eyes chilled as I slipped in towards my stand. Like I said, it was pretty open except for the thicket, which would be on the other side of my stand from where I was coming in. I got about 35 yards or so from my stand and glanced up. It was gone. I don't remember seeing it piled on the ground below, but it was not in the tree. I could see white all around where it had been, like the bark had been scratched and clawed all to hell. And my bag was still hanging on that nail. I never looked back, to, and to this day I have not been back to that swamp. A few years after my little incident, it was all clear-cut, and that part of the swamp was filled in. There are houses there now. I've told a few people about it. The end. Well, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can honestly say uh, that would have probably traumatized me. <laughs> mm. 
<laughs> Use enough gun. Carry enough gun. Yeah. I feel like from the encounters I've heard, an army take wouldn't do anything to, you know, make me feel better. <laughs> That's a great story, and thanks to our guest for um, sending that in to Lauren. What state was that? Okay, listener. <laughs> listener. Yes, yes. Yeah. Tom? Yeah? You there? We have on the line here a special friend of yours and all of ours. Just a second. All right. Henry? Yes, hello. Hello, Henry. Hey, everybody. Hi, Henry. Long time no talk. Uh, Laurie, Lauren, Billy, Grass. Good to hear from you, Henry. Yeah, always yeah. great to be here, yeah. I heard the Ambles was going to be on tonight. Um, matter of fact, I was talking to uh, Kathy Strain before I came on, and um, she said, yeah, Yams is on right now. I said, oh, crap, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, so. Well, thanks for calling in. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to um, get some... Get some questions out. Um, I want to ask you, Yams, about that steel steel. No, that stone head, the one that Tony Pashia got off of uh, eBay a few years yeah. ago. Yeah. Um, has anybody has anybody determined like where it came from and you know what? It, you know, Kathy would know uh, probably know more about that. Uh, I don't know that there's been any uh, determination, you know, the, of where that is from. Um, and I remember how it fit in his palms too. You know, it's a little mm-hmm. stone head. I, I think uh, you mentioned that. I remember stopping in at the Mary Hill Museum to see those, the stone head. I think it was in Meet the Sasquatch. Um, so we stopped in, and there it was in the Native American collection, and it did look pretty ape-like, let's say, you know, and they, I think they were calling it a mountain goat, you know, but hmm. that's the, I think that, the Tony's head is really cool, and I was always glad we took the time to stop, because from Yakima to here, it's a 13-hour, you know, 720-mile drive, and yet we... Bobo and I were coming home in 2008 and took the time to stop, you know, because we're only 80 miles into our drive, too, at that point. You're at the Columbia River. But, uh, yeah, those stone heads that, that, that they had there were really cool. Um, and I've always been intrigued, too, by, you know, the native totems and masks. And uh, I, I think people say Sonaqua. I always say the Sonaqua. Uh, or the Sonaqua or Buk- Bukwas masks, I think, are a great piece of evidence, you know, uh, culture hmm. for Sasquatch. And so Joyce Carney had a beautiful mask that she uh, had acquired in an art native art gallery in California that was carved up there in British Columbia. So anyway, yeah, the Tony Stonehead, I don't know of exactly if they've ever determined exactly, you know, what, where that's from. Hmm. Wow. Um, now, I know you're, you're going to be in Ohio um, uh, this uh, May, you and Bob, Bob Gimlin. Yes. Um, yeah, we're all set, and that's, you know, I to touch on that. It's been, that all started back in 2005, and, and Bob came over and joined us at my invitation to come to the the Bellingham Sasquatch Research Conference, and and he met us. And at that time, I had flown up from here uh, in the Bay Area out of Oakland, and Scotty Scott McLean had flown up from L.A., and Cliff had flown out of Long Beach, and we all arrived in Seattle within 30 minutes of each other, and uh, had a, made a plan to rent a car, you know, and drive up the 90 miles to Bellingham, and uh, Bob met us. Uh, about 30 miles north of Seattle so I, at a, on an exit of Interstate 5, and then we caravaned into town. And there, you know, we stayed together, and it was our first time really staying together and doing something like that. And then, of course, the next year, he was he didn't come to Pocatello to the Bigfoot Rendezvous. 
Um, and so it was 2007, we made a trip up to go camping outside of Yakima with a large group of people, Washington researchers, and again, you know, kind of cemented the, that relationship with Bob. And, and Bob had also been out on the first expedition I was on in 2004 in the Olympic Peninsula, but it was the next summer I organized an event here in the Bay Area, and um, his ride wasn't able to, his ride fell through. He was intending to, to come down to that, and so I ended up driving up from here and taking a, you know, a, a, a few days, and or it took one day, you know, to get up there, and then I picked him up, and we drove back to California, picked Bobo up in Eureka, and drove down over the Golden Gate Bridge to go to that conference uh, in Santa Cruz in August 2008. So I had a week traveling with him then, and I think more or less I became uh, his travel partner, you know. So, uh, yeah. And it was 2010 that Joyce Carney uh, asked us to come to Ohio to the Ohio Bigfoot Conference and paid for our flights. And so that was the first time we flew together. And then uh, it was 2013, and Peter Weimer uh, from We Want You Cottages in Chautauqua Lake, New York, hosted us and, you know, flew us back for a conference there. And then now, you know, of course, Mark DeWorth is a great friend, and we went last year to Ohio and, and are, again, coming back this year. So we're really excited uh, to be able to do that. Yeah, it's going to be great, too. Um no, I I remember last year. Uh, I think uh, you had floated the idea of Bob not necessarily telling about October twentieth this time, but maybe doing like a Q and A session. I think that's the plan. Yeah, and for those, you know, uh, uh, for for uh, I don't know, you guys, have you have you, Lori or Lauren or Gra- any Bill ever been to Ohio to that conference? No. No. Are you talking about no. the one at Salt Fork? <laughs> Yeah, the one at Salt Fork. It's 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 really really great, and uh, it, you know besides I've always wanted to go. Always the nice gathering of yeah. folks, you know, that come in from all over the uh, the country, but mostly the Northeast and the Midwest there, the heartland, and uh, and it was great. That was what Joyce Joyce would drive her Jeep from San Francisco with her dog Chester back each year. I think she had gone to seven, six or seven conferences, and she just really wanted the folks that that attend there uh, to meet Bob and uh and so when we go it is like, like Henry knows it's more uh, like a, a diplomatic ambassador type thing where we try to meet and greet and and spend time with as many people as possible and then typically there's video from 2010 where he gets up and recounts how he knew Roger uh and and the events that led up to October 20th 67 and so this year Henry I think the idea with John Kirk is a, is a keynote or you know a speaker and uh, Jim Sherman and I forget the, the man's name there's a professor coming from South Carolina uh, David uh, Floyd okay thank you and and so for Bob's <laughs> portion it will be uh, a, a, a moderated Q&A and I'll, I'll help with that and sit with him and moderate, you know, and only in to expedite, uh, you know, the questions uh, to him, more or less. It, his hearing's not real great, and, and so folks know, you know, a lot of times mm. that's really all I typically do, you know, is uh, let him know what folks are asking. And uh, so, we'll, yeah, that's the plan this year um, for the for the hour that he's allotted to speak. Mm. Yeah, that that's, that's awesome, you know. Uh, yeah, Lauren Coleman's going to be speaking also. Yes. He's going to talk about uh, Tom Page, who was actually a sponsor of Roger Patterson back in the 60s. Yes, yeah, I'm aware of that uh, through David Murphy's research. That, yeah, That'll be excellent. Lauren is scheduled to speak Friday uh, in town after the dinner in town. So, yeah, I forgot. That. That's going to be great to see Lauren again as well and hear his presentation. And you No, know, for us it's... Uh, it's a lot of travel, it's a lot, but it's well worth it, and uh, we have great friends back there now, and friends that will come and see us. Uh, Were you thinking about having another uh, Yakima coming up uh, at any time? 
no, not 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 uh, not in the immediate future. That was uh, last year's event was 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 uh, one you know uh, that we just did a one time thing. Uh, it, in fact, the the AIBR, the Alliance of Independent Bigfoot Researchers, are at this point uh, brainstorming an idea to have a California conference uh, sometime later this year. So we're We've been looking at locations and are trying to arrange speakers for that, but it's still in the formative stages. But no grass. The the Yakima may happen again. I, you know, uh, I would think uh, never say never. And of course, it's it's more likely that uh, it, it might even occur over on your side, on the west side of the state. You know, something. Right. If I to do a tribute event. I remember years ago, I had brought it up to you that. Uh, Needed some kind of a thing down there on the water, uh, down off uh, Columbia. I brought that up years ago, and then you came up with the Yakima one. Which actually well, Yakima still, came up because the, the ranch was offered uh, where Bob right. helps with the horses there, and he's close friends uh, with the with the ranchers. And then this last year, but no, I would still say I'm looking for some place similar to Salt Fork where you could have both camping and. Uh, Either cabins or a motel with a conference room, and I I know there's a real fancy place I think in I've never been on that north side of the Columbia now, and I've just in the last two years yeah, been pointed out I found one for you a long time ago, and I can't remember the name of it now. It's right there just before it bends to go north, and it's right at the base of uh, the mountain ranges. So it has a cabin, well it has a, a string of cabins, and uh, it has access to the mountains. I can't remember the name. Um, is it east of Vancouver? Oh yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Okay. probably about seventy-five miles uh, east of uh, Portland. Oh, I can't okay. remember uh, on the north side of the river. I can't remember. I'll, I'll just have to look it up. Yeah, yeah. Because I know the Dalles is about eighty miles out. Uh, you know, from when we were there last uh, December two years ago. And, yeah, that was a, that was the place I was uh, talking to you about uh, at okay. that time, and then uh, all of a sudden this ranch came up that you uh, put together for uh, for Bob. Yeah, yeah. No, that well, was fun. that was uh, worked out great. The, it was a lot of infrastructure we had to bring in there. Henry was there, and we had to bring. Yeah, in I missed it. The, yeah, <laughs> I missed it for some reason, brother. I can't now, remember what. what. About what about Mike Rugg? I mean, I know he was holding the Bigfoot Discovery Days for a while. I think the last one he held was either 2012 or 2013. Yep. Yeah, that I down don't know. The museum? Yeah, we were having them in in the town of Felton, and we did uh, one in Santa Cruz in 2007. Um, no, I'm not in touch. You know, I'm not down there at the museum uh, much anymore. So. It's about a you know 130 miles to do the round trip, so I haven't heard from Mike and uh, and if they've got any plans to do anything. Now we're going to do this with the AIBR out in the Sierras, you know, the in the Gold Country foothills, either Placerville or Sonora, and uh, we you know want to do it with uh, just a, a, a I'd say based more on like a one day conference, 12 to 6, you know, afternoon. Maybe some workshops, and uh, it it would be over towards the Sierras. Well, Henry, yeah, you got to go to intermission now. All right, um, I'm going to hang up anyway, but I just wanted to kind of touch base with you guys. You agree? No problem. <laughs> Thanks for calling in. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Henry. Uh huh. Talk to you Great. later. Uh huh. All right, Henry. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, um, we're going to go to an admission, I guess. Yeah, before we do, though, I would like um, Tom to explain to our listeners, our newer listeners, who Jerry Cruz is, because that's who this, this song is coming up. It is one that Tom has done himself, oh, him and that. James Bobo Fay. That's so right. If you would explain who Jerry Crew is to our newer listeners, I'd that love would be to. Great. Yeah, Jerry Crew is a, an inspirational figure. Um, as the song says, he knew what to do, and he was a, a, a bulldozer operator. Uh, and, you know, drove the big cat, and was uh, they were road building in order to log uh, the Six Rivers National Forest. 
which is where Bluff Creek is. And in fact, uh, uh, we now still drive over the old bridges that are in, with the dates, the year impressed in the concrete, you know, 57, 58. But the, Jerry's event happened in uh, October 1958. And they were finding footprints around, and, and back then they'd just blade the road, uh, and it would just be fresh dirt, no gravel. So it was just perfect for holding the print. And they'd come back to work and find these huge footprints. And, and of course, as we all know, Ray Wallace was involved with uh, as foreman uh, or contractor for, for that work. But uh, uh, these prints were... Uh, weren't fooling anybody uh you know his wooden prints i don't even know that he was making them then we we theorized yeah that was a big controversy there i I used to have a cast of that yeah no the uh uh the these prints that jerry and the others were seeing they they were showing uh uh, uh, aspects that were beyond human capability coming down these hillsides uh, uh, going with steps and strides that were you know uh beyond what a human could do and then they went down really steep inclines you know they followed him they tried to track the the creature so the great story with jerry crew was uh he was telling they were telling these stories in town and uh and people were weren't believing them and they didn't mind that but then they started to say uh, d- d- disparaging things about the loggers or seeing things up there drunk loggers don't you know and so jerry wasn't a drunk logger he was a teetotaling you know uh, 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 held in high regard in the community and uh, so they asked a, uh, a taxidermist named bob titmus who went on to become one of the legendary figures in sasquatch research for tracking and casting and so bob titmus actually gave jerry the plaster to make this cast and when then what put jerry on the map was he brought it out and he took it to eureka one day to show some friends and they told him to go show the editor at the eureka times standard uh uh Andrew Genzoli. That's all written up in the song. So I had this idea to honor Jerry Crew in a song. And Bobo, one night on a rainy, uh, interrupted expedition by the rain, we were sitting under a uh, an awning at a motel, uh, and I got out the guitar and I played him the song. And he came up with two really great lines. You know, so of course by Nashville and Lennon and McCartney rules, he had to be credited with it. As a co-writer, uh, <laughs> so it's called Jerry Crew. He knew what to do. Yes, and we shall hear that song right now. Great. It's and now a song a by Tom Yamarone and James Bobo Fay, and also a word on the Nocturnal Eye. You are listening to Nightcallers Bigfoot Radio. Thank you. 
Mexico shows him soul You put it next to the food Says it's the new Sasquatch We'll call it Bigfoot This wasn't the first that they heard in the floor There were two stories about it that had been written before Carrie Fisher went well, why did the story was told There was a big hairy man in the woods of Humboldt Gary Clue, he knew what to do Stop, Jerry. He knew what to do. Yeah, he knew what to do. Ray Wallace said he did it, but he's an old liar. If he could make a fucking sense equipment on fire, not all of the tracks should be made by his clan. So there's an animal out there, he's just a loose man. Now we know it's filmed, it came off that track. The Jerry Cruz is constructing, and the creatures are black. Yeah, Gimlin and Patterson gave the world a good view, but it's not to thank Jerry, because he knew what to do. Jerry Cruz he knew what to do. Yeah, Jerry Cruz those who believe him were part of you. Stop, Jerry. Look, he knew what to do. Yeah, he knew what to do. Jerry Cruz, he knew what to do. Man, the Jerry Cruz knew what to do. He liked that mountain and he went to the zoo. <laughs> today. Most researchers believe Bigfoot to be a nocturnal species, meaning they are most active during the night. This has also led to the theory that these beings must have some sort of enhanced night vision. Nocturnal animals tend to have proportionately bigger eyes than humans do. They also tend to have pupils that open more widely in low light. So at the outset, nocturnal eyes gather more light than humans do. After the light passes through the pupil, it is focused by the lens onto the retina, which is connected to the brain by the optic nerve. The retina is an extremely complex structure. It is made up of at least 10 distinguishable layers and is packed with more sensory nerve cells than anywhere else in the body. The retina is home to two different kinds of light receptor cells, rods and cones. Cones work in bright light and register detail, while rods work in low light, detecting motion and basic visual information. It is the rods that become highly specialized in nocturnal animals. In fact, many bats, nocturnal snakes, and lizards have no cones at all, while other nocturnal animals have just a few. Many nocturnal eyes are equipped with a feature designed to amplify the amount of light that reaches the retina. Called a tapetum, this mirror-like membrane reflects light that has already passed through the retina back through the retina a second time, giving the light another chance to strike the light-sensitive rods. Whatever light is not absorbed on this return trip passes out the eye the same way it came in, through the pupil. Thus, you have eye shine. The presence of tatum can be observed at night with a pair of glowing eyes, reflecting back a flashlight or some other light source. In respect to the Bigfoot eye, it is very likely that the Bigfoot have either more rods, very much larger rods, and probably a much broader tatum in their pupil, which allows them to have most excellent night vision, also allows them to be able to have a much larger and brighter, more brilliant eye shine. In that respect, their pupils are wide open at night, and we should take great care with our light equipment at night that we don't harm them. Thank you for your time, and now back to Nightcaller's Bigfoot Talk Radio. Okay, we are back from break, and back mm-hmm. with Tom Yamaron. How are you doing tonight, Tom? You're doing a fantastic job on our show. Oh, I'm really enjoying it. Hey, that was an excellent piece on the uh, eye, the Bigfoot oh, eye. Thank you. Thank you. Really enjoyed that. No, oh, enjoying the conversation. Um, and uh, but I want to make sure to let people know where they can find me online. Um, I do have a, a blog. I don't often 
post, but it's at um, um, bigfootsongs.blogspot.com at this point. I'm, it used to just be bigfootsongs.com, but now you need the blog spot to get there. And then my YouTube channel is youtube.com slash um, bigfootsongs04. And, yeah, I'm also on Facebook, uh, but, um, you know, at this point, I'm enjoying uh, the people I've met and would hope to meet you all someday. And uh, it's been a great, great time, uh, you know, not just a great time, but I've learned a lot, and I, I, I feel like there's a like-minded group out there. And, I, again, I mentioned, you know, of course, Kathy and Bob Strain and uh, Dr. Meldrum and Dr. Bender Noggle, John Kirk in his British Columbia Cryptozoology, Scientific Cryptozoology Club in Canada and uh, others, you know, Cliff Berrickman, Bobo Fay, uh, that that uh, indeed, I, I, I think there's really great evidence out there that these creatures exist, the footprint evidence, and then uh, besides that, the the Native American masks and totems. Uh, the, the one of Scott McLean's great achievements. Those peer, uh, pioneer newspaper articles that indeed reflect many many of them. Some of the same things that are observed uh, in the recent times uh, with Sasquatch sightings. And and so you just go th- uh, you know uh, bullet point after bullet point, and it all adds up to me being able to say, like I say in my bio, without having seen one, I know, I'm convinced they exist. And whether or not we'll ever be able to get that definitive proof or whether that's necessary, that's all open for discussion. Well, you know, we've interviewed a lot of uh, researchers out there that have never had a sighting, but yet they're believers. And it's the evidence itself, the the eyewitness accounts, uh, all those yeah. things that convince them that they are really real, because there are real people seeing them. And well, yeah, and I'll tell you, you meet people like bugs, or uh, and there's many others. I, I've really been fortunate to meet quite a few eyewitnesses, that, uh, and Bob, you know, Bob Gimlin, Bob Strain, uh, uh-huh. others, and and. Uh, but and and they're lucky. I, they're lucky, and in some cases, like Sandy, they're they're traumatized. You know, there's there's a there's a side of it where they're not lucky. So, um, you know, uh, but yeah, I hope too. You know, everyone's got that wish. I, I, somebody I once was lucky in my that first few months. This guy I had met gave me this man named gave me Archie Buckley's phone number and said, give this guy a call. And at that time, his health was failing. He was a, an original member of this Bay Area group, and they were depicted uh, in one of uh, Leonard Nimoy's In Search of episodes. Uh, and Archie Buckley's famous for hanging the fish in the tree uh, in the Trinity National Forest, and with the uh, he's depicted in a Volkswagen in, in Search of going, come on, Ook. Come on, Ook, old friend. And, you know, that's Archie Buckley. He's, they did some really, I think, groundbreaking research with a man named George Haas and and others in this uh, Bay Area in the 1970s and 80s. And um, so I called him. This was 2003. And, and he first thing he asked me is, why am I, why do I want to do this? What do I want to get out of it? And, you know, what's my goal? And besides learning more about them, I, yeah, I had this ambition and still do, you know, to try to obtain video, try to obtain, so not, you know, I would consider that proof, but so, something to show my folks and my family, you know, so that's what I always say, something to show my folks, my family, my friends, and uh, and uh, that hasn't happened. Uh, still hope it, it will. Uh, I think now... You know, we I've, technology has sort of passed me by. I'm aware of what's out there, hun. Um, so, yeah, I think it, the the next big thing might be maybe we all get a dash cam. You know, but uh, oh yeah. But but it, you know, I'm so I'm running on here. But you know, the other thing that's really important, and you don't see this on YouTube, and it's a shame. And that's what I mean about trying to educate folks about documenting <clears throat> possible evidence, and you know. Uh, but this is in regards to videos. 
you really do need a comparison video. You do need that data. And this was from a man named Rick Knoll who posted in the early days of the Bigfoot forums. You need to know, you know where the camera was, where the subject was approximately, uh, height of the camera from the ground, uh, a general uh, map of the area. You, know, you, need to, you need all those things. You can't just put something up there and say, see, you know, what do you think? And, yeah. and so... <laughs> Blob, watch this. You know, there's maybe some of that is legitimate footage, but in, and and I will say kudos to Finding Bigfoot for whatever you all feel about having watched you know sixty some odd episodes and and it does get formulaic. But what they do with witnesses and what they do to follow up and try to compare things that that's I think that's dead on. You know, that's I just, agree. Just what needs yep. to happen. Well, one of my peeves is that people need to learn how to use their cameras. They need yeah. to study the camera and actually learn how to be a video videographer when they're out there in the woods. <clears throat> you see them just uh, moving the camera all over the place. It's out of uh, out of focus. It's, uh, <laughs> right. The lighting's terrible. Blah 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 blah. They're not doing it. Most of the time, they're just randomly life. videoing though, and they don't even realize they are filming a Sasquatch. Until yeah. well, that's what's happened to me twice. Oh, really? I had don't Sasquatch did my it. video and didn't even know I was videoing a Sasquatch. Had yeah. I known that, I, you know, it's frustrating because you're watching it and you're going, oh, my God, be still, be still. But it's already over with. And if I, if I had even a clue that one had been there, I would have been right. more, you know. But, well, you know, uh, that goes to where, sorry to interrupt you, this is Lori, right? Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, it, it goes to what was that, Bill? Who said that? Learn how to use your equipment. No, no that right. was that. Yeah, Grass. Okay. Well, uh, uh, you know that it goes to like what, uh, like well, that's what Roger Patterson did. You know, he practiced and practiced. But uh, there's always that argument that everyone's got a camera now on their phone. You know, and but yet uh, we also have recorders. So when I I hear these reports, and there was one that came into the group uh, last year, or uh, campground awoken up on, uh, it's Tuolumne Pass above Yosemite Valley, the, the pass that goes through the Sierras. And so a campground there was experiencing ongoing calls at like dawn, you know, one one day last summer. And I just think, gosh, I know I have my phone. I know I'm not using it. I'm out of cell range, but I there's a clock or, you know, or I had a recorder. But, but I mean, if they knew to just, turn on their recorder or shoot video even with your digital camera even though it's pitch black you'll catch the audio so there's little tricks like that and that's i hope that's where the it, the push for education goes because the more you try to inform the public about that uh using a scale item in your photos and not your shoe not your foot uh and hopefully people will begin to carry larger tape measures you know that you can read and or rulers, uh, uh, and, and I go back to as well that like Jerry Crew, Al Hodgson. You look at those photos uh, in in the in Bob Titmus. They all have rulers in them, you know. And uh, so, anyway, that's something where uh, I, that's kind of and it takes an extra few minutes to break that out, put it in the picture. Uh, but boy, people are finding good evidence, and it's just not. Well, it takes practice and practice and practice and practice ahead of time before the situation even happens so that everything becomes automatic. Uh, when you see a footprint, you have all this stuff in your head about what you have to do with it. Right. If you see a Bigfoot in the distance, where's your camera? You don't just stand there with your jaw dropped down. Yeah. And oh, yes, you do. A lot, of people, I mean, a lot of people do it, but you have to practice in your head. It's like being in the military. You have to have a sense of of automatic reaction to a situation. Right. Or, 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 well, that's, or have, that in a perfect no. world. Well, and the other thing, Graz, is um, uh, folks, too, it, it seems enough to just take one picture, two pictures from straight above. But, again, mm-hmm. when this is something Cliff and I and we all over the years have mm-hmm. evolved, you know, you're not burning film anymore, you know, so w- you need five pictures. You need pictures from every angle and then low right, angle. From the side, from, from, and then from take about 20 level, steps back. 
you know, and get that whole scene in there too, because mm. uh, that's really important too. Uh, uh, yeah, so those things, uh, uh, they're ideals, and you're right. Uh, practice makes perfect. And workshops, and now I realize, uh, even I discovered on my field guide that Jeff put out of, a couple of years ago, that laminated field guide, there's a how-to section on the back, and, uh, you know, how to photograph, how to cast, and it's very, very good. But again, uh, you know, let's all admit it, there's not, not a lot of uh, reading goes on anymore, so it almost has to be a, a how-to video, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, so that that might be something to do uh, as a future goal. Uh, I, I definitely think you know, and and it's, it all goes back to. But how you know, y- you do need to practice this, and we we wish there was better documentation, and there will be, you know, and and yet uh, it's great. I think that it couldn't be a better time for Bigfoot Sasquatch research. There's uh, certainly a, a good. Uh, uh, embracing, uh, accepting community to bring the stories forth, uh, and you still got to filter them, you know, for the the posers and the hoaxers and whatnot. And uh, but but you really have this time where um, uh, people are involved that uh, are sincere about it, and uh, it, it's popular. So. Uh, I'm 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 really optimistic and and then of course on the other side of it being a Gemini I have that whole fun side of it with the music and and getting into uh, running into Bobcat Goldthwait up there and and him feeling like the song Roger and Bob fit the storyline of the movie Willow Creek and you know getting that minute and thirty second segment and then now you uh, you brought uh, that back up yeah. you brought that back up let's go to Bob. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I love it. That's been the best, one of the best things that's ever happened uh, with the music, and uh, and of course, you know, the music's just basically been there all along. You know, some of them tell a story, and that one does, and it's a tribute to Patterson and Gimlin. So we were in Willow Creek, and uh, this was Scott McLean's last trip. Uh, we he drove up here with Bobo uh, from L.A. Uh, and he was sick at the time. He had cancer, and uh, but he was well enough to go out and uh, was managing his pain. Uh, and so we camped with a great, great group of folks uh, that were measuring the film site that week. And and we were coming out, and you're always pretty beat. It was hot, you know. It's always hot in that area in the summer. And we got to town. We were with our friends Terry uh, and. Todd, Terry Smith, and Todd Hale, and we stayed a night at a hotel just to regroup uh, in in Hoopa. Then the next day, I called Al Hodgson, and his uh, son lives with him now. He's getting on in years, and he's not generally getting out and about as much, and so he agreed to meet us, just Scott and I, for lunch. Uh, He didn't want a big group, and so we had lunch with Al Hodgson, and it was awesome, and, you know, just a really nice visit, and... uh, Afterwards, we walked over to the museum, and as we were walking in, a young lady uh, ran up to us and said, hey, hey, are you the guys with the Bigfoot stories? And we looked at each other and said, no, this is Scott McLean. He's researched, you know, pioneered newspaper articles. And Scott did have a sighting from, uh, I think, South North Carolina uh, in, in an early morning drive. And, and then I said, this is Al Hodgson, who ran the general store in town for many years and was essential in getting this museum uh, Bigfoot Wing founded and and I you know I'm who I am and uh and I mentioned the songs and she said songs about what and I mentioned the Patterson Gimlin film and she said great and said would you meet us over at the bookstore at Steve's bookstore uh, we'll be there in a couple hours and and so uh we did and we were over there and Cliff was there and uh uh, uh, the the crew that filmed Willow Creek was just the actor and actress uh, Bryce Johnson and Alexi Gilmore, and didn't know them at the time, and have since gotten to know them. and And the producer is Amy Pearson, and uh, Bobcat was the writer director, and uh, they had a sound guy and a cameraman, and that was it. And we walked around the back of these cabins into an oak tree type setting and uh, played Roger and Bob for. 20 minutes and uh and then about four months later the phone rang and it was him calling to say hey we're gonna use that 
so why don't you uh, you know work out an agreement with my music director and uh, we did and then it was probably a, a year later in May we the, he pre, he showed it in uh, Arcata California and uh, yeah so it's a it's a it's listed as a horror movie but it's actually awesome you know for us because uh, and the first part of it is they're going around Willow Creek looking at the Bigfoot stuff and and they're, they're but their whole point of it is they're trying to find where the where the film was made so they're talking to people and going to meet people and they talk to Steve in the bookstore at length and but they also you know are kind of having fun and then the the whole juxtaposition of the boyfriend who's making this film or documentary about going back to the film site and the girlfriend who is just begrudgingly doing it doesn't believe in anything to do with Bigfoot and it ends up with them uh, you know getting into the back country and things become sort of Blair Witch like uh, but but the great <laughs> yeah. part is those are the actual roads we drive and you would drive if you were to go to Laos Camp or the film site and so that's what was that's one of the coolest things I like about the movie is you see the the roads that lead to Willow Creek the roads that lead from Hoopa to Wichapek uh, the Go Road you know that the road to Laos Camp and so uh uh, the Blue Pool at Laos Camp. Uh, so for anyone who's really into Bigfoot, that's probably the coolest aspect of it. And then uh, to top it off, he then had a, a, a independent rock band from West Virginia named Roswell Kid cover Roger and Bob for the closing credits. So uh, that was a great surprise when we first saw the movie, you know. Anyway, that's the Willow Creek. How does the person go about seeing this movie? You know, it's out on DVD and Blu-ray, and last summer it was available on these on-demand rentals. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, You know, we watched it on, uh, I think it was Amazon. What's that Amazon called, Mare? Okay. Yeah. Uh, You know, there was an Amazon video service, and... uh, it was a little complicated, but uh, yeah. So the, it, it's a, it's out there now. It's in distribution, um, and uh, yeah, I'm trying to make it a Bigfoot uh, cult classic. You know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah, Bob yeah. Goldthwait involved. Yes. Hey, he's made some great independent films. Uh, you know, we know him from coming out and you know making the funny noises at the microphone, right? And, Right. In the eighties, and uh, I guess he was in. Oh, I know him. He was in Blow for the cameo appearance, and he was also in the Police Academy too, uh, and right. other movies, Hot to Trot, and uh, <laughs> I've since, you know, bought all his movies on DVD. He he made one with Robin Williams called World's Greatest Dad, uh, and he has another one let, where Let Sleeping Dogs Lie. Uh, I'm curious how he got involved in Bigfoot. And does, does he believe in Bigfoot? He, he yes. searches it. Oh, himself? super informed, and and that was really really inspirational too. That he was like, because you know we had done this half hour show with Bob Saget once back in 2010, and yeah, that was a know, bit of a mess. That's what you'd expect, right? And yet Bob Goldthwait was just great. Uh, he he knows the subject, uh, and he really knows the subject, and and it shows in the movie. I I hope you all are able to see it sometime. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh but but <clears throat> yeah, and, and that was great. He had a real regard for the film, and that's where the the male character is the is a real uh, you know a proponent of it, and 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 the dialogue is is some of it's um, uh, improvised, but it's based on. You know, he always said in interviews it was based on he and his wife, Bobcat, you know, <laughs> and now they'd argue about the subject. But said he had a childhood interest in it. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. And he always wanted to make a Bigfoot film. And uh, so, uh, did, did, you, yeah. did he ever go out with you guys, like maybe with uh, some of the Beef Row guys or what? Uh, no, but what he did, I guess he must have gone to he went to a conference somewhere, but that day, see, I had no idea. I guess he had talked to Steve at the bookstore and told him he was coming, but when we all camped together, uh, Steve never mentioned it. So for us, it was all 
you know, excuse me, a surprise, but uh, that week, so Scotty wanted to get home, so that night we drove back to the Bay Area. The next day he drove home, uh, and even Bobo didn't want to go. You know, we were like you said, when you come out of five days camping, you're not feeling like doing more stuff. You know, you're just kind of <laughs> ready to get home, and, and so Bobo went home, and, and uh, Cliff came by and did a part that's now a, an additional feature, you know, uh, but but Rob Leiterman went camping with them, so they they yeah had directions, had maps, and went to Laos camp. Right. And so uh, Robert Leiterman was there with them. And then a year later, he came and uh, we did a one night camp out. It was really cool. He called on Labor Day weekend and was doing a comedy show in Arcata on a Sunday night. Uh, and then we went out Monday of Labor Day into Laos camp for a night. And turned out he was shooting additional footage with a high-def camera that was then added to the movie. But, uh, yeah, so we had a fun night camping. They're great people. They're, I got, I'm glad to call them, I hope, friends. You know, they're really uh, – uh, I went up and followed them around from uh, Seattle to Eugene to Portland last summer as they showed the movie – in a theater in each of those towns, and uh, he would do a Q and A after the movie with the uh, with Bryce and Alexi there, and then uh, he ha- he would let me get up and play the whole song, you know, because <laughs> there's only you know three verses in the movie, but uh, yeah, that was awesome. All right, everyone's still awake. No, <laughs> yes, yes. Is it uh, back to me? Yes. Mm-hmm. What's it like to research with Bobo Fay? Well, is, yeah, it, great. is he is he is he like he is on the program, or is he does he do something different in real life? Well, you know, he's was our he's our expert for for all things Bigfoot and all things Bigfoot in that area. He was the go to guy. Let's call him. Uh, you know, was got up there in the 1980s was involved with other groups, I think, in the late, mid-90s. I, I know John Freitas was up there uh, living north of there near Crescent City. And, of course, there was other researchers. But when I met Bobo, and this was in BFRO, uh, he was the the expert, you know. The, and, and I mean by that, you know, the, the informed one. So the, the one to go mm-hmm. ask, you know, what are we going to do? Uh, what would you do? And... Uh, and so for that, and he has a, 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 an astute memory, uh, re- great retention for stories and experiences. And so a lot of it comes to him. The, the anecdotal accounts from that county, uh, you know, have, have made their way to Bobo. And, and what you see on the show, yeah, he's opinionated uh, and he's funny, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, he, he he's a... Uh, has a huge heart. Uh, is a very compassionate person as well. He's not just real short or, or condescending, you know. So, uh, and I'm grateful that in all the friendships I've made, you know, that, that his is, is is one of them. And uh, I'm like a feel like he's a brother to me. So, uh, you know, I know I have a different uh, opinion. You know, I have of course a, a, a real close uh, observation there, but. No, what you see, Bobo. That's that's Bobo. And uh, in other words, you're prejudiced because you're friends. <laughs> yeah, I am. But uh, I also think I'm given an honest evaluation of who who he is, because uh, uh, that that is him. And I've seen it in in cases around town and people he's helped and families like that he had, you know helped with the kids growing up. And uh, so, uh, but but he you know to be in the field with them, there's. A few people like that, like Bob Strain, uh, Cliff, uh, this man Mel Scahan from the Yakima Nation. There's and there's others. I'm sorry if I'm leaving folks out, Terry. Uh, but there's people you're in the woods with that you just it it, it it's great. They're a great comfort to be with. You know, I'd say he's an he's an excellent outdoorsman. You know, so uh, you know there's that aspect too of being with him. So yeah. That's Bobo. I would love to have Bobo on the show. Please put that bug in his ear. 
said I would I'm love to have him on. I was hoping show. to get him to call in, but I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't text him, you know. But uh, sometimes he <laughs> call in. But uh, it, then, then it just becomes a love fest. So. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, yams. That's great, yams. And yeah, so no. Yeah, no. Uh, I hope to see him soon. You know, they're uh, they're uh, working still. They're still working. So it's uh, going well for them and the show. So uh, I know. Yeah, I, I know, don't have TV out here, so I don't get to watch them. But uh, when they were on the air, I when when I had satellite TV, I watched them faithfully. I, I found that found that. Um, I learned, actually learned something from that show on occasion. And then there were other times I was throwing pillows at it, going, ah, <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's, just, it's just a love-hate thing, but there were times that I actually learned something or had something confirmed, and uh, it was great. It, it really was. It was great. So I hate that I don't get to see them anymore. But. Yeah, I yeah, know that there, there was um, they actually did an, an episode in New Jersey with Bobcat Goldthwait. Fairly entertaining. Uh, <laughs> hey, but but uh, to to like a general discussion here, if we could, I I, sure. I listened to Dave's show. I mean, I was I'm glad to hear uh, Bill's opinion of uh, uh, that that yeah that video that just wouldn't go away this winter of the. Cross country skiers, <laughs> old faithful, <Yes. laughs> and uh, oh, oh, you know. So I, I want to open it up to you know, people need to be patient, and there's there's always something that goes rampant during the winter, but, but you just you know there needs to be patience with this, and and in time, you know, and if and we know there's probably somewhere some real good situations happening now, whether or not they'll get documented well. That's another. So, because right for all along, we had the Erickson project going on, and I did know the people involved, and they abided, you know, by their NDAs. And then when it eventually was all right, he won't release that until the DNA study. And you know, to be kind, I think the DNA study didn't, in my opinion, live up to the what it was supposed to be. Uh, you know, the, yeah, the level of. So no, let's not get started there. But just about you know the 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 subject in general and kind of viral videos and and people being patient. And have you or, or does yes. anybody want to talk about anything like that? Or yes, that sounds great. Uh, I, I would I would like to address it. We <laughs> have about ten minutes left. So yeah, great. I, I would like you to talk about what you would like to talk about, and if that's what you would like to talk about, we are. We will oblige you. <laughs> oh no, thanks, thanks. No, no, I just could hear from you, and I mean, I didn't think of one right now. I know I see, well, the, see him I, I do have a frustrating kind of a, a thought about the Erickson Project kind of thing that goes on every once in a while. You're talking about documentary of evidence and things like making yes. sure everything's put in its place. Jane Somebody made the mistake of announcing that the project was uh, doing this and that and the other thing. And time was going on and on and on, and, and nothing was happening. And he had three, four, almost five years of everybody speculating, all these supposed leaks coming out, yep. um, and all of the problems that were surrounding that, including Ketchum. And Ketchum goes into another field that I could talk about at another time. Well, where right. there, it, She turned out to be a bit of a problem. And that, in, and that includes some archaeological work that she's doing. But the whole thing it just turned into an emotional meltdown for people because it took so long and all these leaks were going out. That's a lesson about how you document everything and how you release the material as you're going, or you release it all at once or whatever. It, it, it's a personal thing, and it's, and it's a bit of a debate about how to approach it. What do you think about that? Uh, you know what, Rick Knoll once, uh, in the, I'll say this, Grass was there in the early days of the Bigfoot forms. Right. He put up a 10-step mm -hmm. list of what to do if you got video. He and was trying the, hard to get that out. It, it, and it, I, I have it in my field notes, in my little map guide, but one of the things was 
of you did. Well, one of the things was uh, release a still image with a watermark right across it, but release your best still image after you you've made contacts and whatever legal uh, arrangement you need to make if you're worried about copyrights or whatnot. But but that's what's frustrating, I think, with these projects is we get these teasers. Oh, fine, it must have been every October. Teaser, teaser. We hear that it's almost ready, it's almost done. And then Erickson got up at John Green's tribute, Adrian, and said, you know, this will be the year. And then when they released those little clips, well, there was none, no comparison videos, no contextual data. All these mm -hmm. things, I kept being told, oh, yeah, we'll do that. I'm, I'm, that's, that's how it will be released. And, and, and yet, I, I guess we still have never seen the documentary, but, yeah, so it just wasn't done right. From, from what we know. And then someone made a quick announcement at the Yakima conference. Uh, or made oh, that a, was, a blur. Is that Mike you know, Green and his video? No, it was the uh, it was about the Erickson Project. Uh, who's the professor up here in Vancouver? I keep forgetting his name. Uh, John Bindernongle? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. At, was it at the Yakima conference, I think, where he made a, a statement of some kind? And I can't remember what the statement was, but that added fuel to the fire. And then he, well, you, he yeah. admitted that it was a mistake that he mentioned it while he was up oh. on the stage. And I can't remember what that was. You know, it was Adrian. Adrian got up to do – at John's event, we had a – after the banquet, a tribute. And uh, people would come up to the podium. And it was actually Adrian Erickson himself who <laughs> said – Really? Yes, that this will That's be the year. And uh, – uh, now, I know John did go to the property. You know, I know that, uh, and that was the big rumor around that was that he had seen one there. Right. And, and he, he hasn't backpedaled, but he'll say to you, I saw a, a silhouette, an arm, a shoulder, you know, uh, you know, in the bushes. So, uh, uh, I, I don't know. Again, I think the only reason I brought it up was because, again, that, that Yellowstone thing just wouldn't go away, and, and it gets carried on the news services. You know, or the you know the whatever Huffington Post and all that, and and so yeah, the, that's where you really would hope people would do the due diligence, um, but they won't. You know, they want to release it, they want to get hits. There's uh, the the Bigfoot evidence site. That's uh, he's a nice guy. I've met him, but he's all just about getting hits. And the early days, about half of what he had was just, you know, wasn't what the the headline was, and. <laughs> And then the thinker thunker stuff out there uh, floating around that everybody's arguing about. Um, and yeah. The, uh, the Yellowstone with the buffalo and all that kind of stuff, where it turns well, out it's just skiers in the background. People are still posting that. Well, when you well the way he photoshopped it and moved that one up, and then he says, you know, what do you? Because again, like I heard you talk about him on Dave's show on that episode, and you were dead on. You can't be making these assumptions you've got to use scales and math and you can't make estimates there's a lot of folks go around making estimates and um it doesn't it, it doesn't become scientific evidence doing that so anyway yeah it's a little with pet peeve. and with the trolls who are uh, making noise <clears throat> about it and trolls making noise about the situation and, <laughs> and it just uh, it just turns into a big mess on the internet all the blogs and all the Facebook pages and uh, groups and everybody's arguing about this, that, and the other thing. Uh, hey, I will say, though, you know, it just spurred something in my mind that I meant to talk about tonight, too. That, I, And I know it's probably not getting read or purchased as much as it should, but Bill Munz's book is excellent. And I don't know where at the very end, I think it became personal attacks on him that he's not – qualified to do this research and but but in the end you know bill munns definitely f authenticates the film subject and um i'm still not sure what the argument is against his work but uh i also think that that it needs to be disseminated almost like, not like cliff notes but summarized you know what are the key points of each chapter because it's so thorough but uh you know, that, that's an exciting thing that happened in the last year that I think hasn't really made the rounds yet as well, you know, Bill's work. And, you know, I'm a big proponent of the PG film as a as a person. Oh, yes, I do. 
so Roger and Bob, you know, then the songs that were tributes and and uh-huh. uh, and of course the Ballad of Alberto. That's more of a funny retelling. I love that song. Thank I love you. that song. You know, it's that, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. So it would be nice. Maybe we could end with a song. I, I wish, we? wish we could. Are you going to sing it? Oh, does <laughs> does Lauren need to play it? Was only well, I don't have it uploaded. Okay, I that's all right. Don't. It would have been great, though, but it would have been a great way to end the show. <laughs> okay. Dang. Well, maybe we can pull something off here. Let's see. I have. I have I can always play it and no, <laughs> run no, it I've, over my I've, phone. <laughs> I've been requested to phone it in before, so let's see. The guitar's right here. Yeah, oh. Albert O. Now I'd need Henry May to sing along with me. <laughs> oh, I we just, have we got three call minutes in. left. The, the we got three minutes. Left. Maybe, you, maybe you can do a couple of bars. All right, here we go. Well, we've all been out camping. It's a fun place to go. Some go in groups, and some go alone. Some go to the mountains. Some even camp in the snow. But no one's had a camping trip. Like old Albert O. <laughs> now he took a vacation to do some prospecting for gold. He rode the boat to Toba Inlet. It was a good place, he was told. His Indian guide warned him about the Sasquatch. But Albert ignored him, saying, man, you drink too much scotch. <laughs> well, he hiked into the woods. For three days, all was fine. Day four came along. Things began to unwind. His backpack was ransacked. He lost his flower and prunes. He would wait for this critter by the light of the moon. Well, now he waited and waited. Eyelids they closed. He was snatched up in his sleeping bag, but still Albert dozed. He woke up in a bundle he couldn't grab for his knife. Yeah, Albert Osman was in for the ride of his life. Well, Albert, oh, Albert, what did you see? Them Sasquatch made you one of the family. Albert, oh, Albert, what do you say? You not only saw Sasquatch, you got carried away. Mm, Hey. Thank you. That was awesome. (laughs) That was great. We have never had anybody sing live on our show. All right. Well, my you pleasure. Are the first. Thank you for having me tonight. Really enjoyed being on with you all. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so for much for coming. On. You are a great guest. Great guest. Yeah. Well, it was good we to finally really talk. We really enjoyed it. Yeah, you hey, as well. Hey, next time you come, you need to bring Bobo with you. I'd love to have the both of you on the show. That would be awesome. All right. Well, okay. I can only, yeah. I can only imagine the back and forth banter that would happen there. Oh yeah, <laughs> we would we would just sit aside, and let y'all take it over. Yeah, yeah. We would just interrupt <laughs> you for breaks. That's all. <laughs> well, I'll see what I can do. I definitely will let him know how it went. It was great, you know. So, okay. uh, but uh, yeah. but regardless, we would love to have you back on sometime. Um, oh, I would. Just, thank you. Yeah, you are a great guest. I would appreciate it. I'd love to come back. And no, it's been a pleasure, and <laughs> really enjoyed it. So. Thank you all again for having thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Okay. Good night, Tom. Good night, callers. Good night. Good night, Good night. Good night everybody. We will see y'all next week. Good night, Good night everybody. everybody. Good night. Good night.